Yes, it is the um, presentation on Westinghouse and KDKA. Uh, let's see, it should bring it in. And um, let's see, where did I lose you? You're up. Yes. Yep, we okay. see X screen. Um, <clears throat> I noticed I'm at the end of a long line of really good speakers, each one a little better than the one before. So I'm going to see if I could change that trajectory uh, today and go through a lot of sites really fast and hopefully everybody can can follow along. The um, got to move that. OK. <clears throat> uh, the role of Westinghouse and KDKA in this history of broadcasting starts with George Westinghouse, Jr., who started a company that would last over a century. And it all began with an invention that solved a safety problem on the railroads. At the age of 23, he was awarded this patent for a fail-safe air brake system that would save the lives of many railroad passengers. His fail-safe innovation used a, uh, the steam power from the engine to hold the brakes open. If the system failed, the loss of steam power caused the brakes to grab and bring the train to a safe stop. So he soon formed the Westinghouse Air Brake Company to, pr to produce the uh, invention, and uh, the company quickly grew uh, supplying systems for the railroad cars of many different manufacturers. In 1886, Westinghouse sees another business opportunity. He creates the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company, and he makes plans to use alternating current to electrify America. While many of the robber barons at the time were despised by their employees, Westinghouse was held in pretty high regard. Personable and generous, he provided excellent benefits at the time. A hands-on guy often working alongside his employees. He never suffered from the bitter job actions at the time, and he even made Saturdays a half work day. These personal qualities helped Westinghouse attract talented people to join his team. To create a system of AC power, there would be none other to join than Nikola Tesla. An AC power system would have to not only light incandescent lamps, but had to run powerful motors, both for industry and home appliances. And Tesla's polyphase motors could do the job. To distribute AC power required AC transformers and inventor William Stanley Jr. joined the team. The battle lines were drawn as their rival, Thomas Edison and the Edison General Electric Company promoted their DC direct current system. Although the press pictured Edison versus Tesla, Westinghouse was the general really commanding the AC team. And in 1888, this was the headquarters for the alternating current team. In this battle of the currents, would Westinghouse or Edison be the ones awarded the contract to harness the immense power of Niagara Falls to produce electricity? While Westinghouse proposed an efficient system, Edison charged that the Westinghouse AC system was a danger to the public. As American cities grew, the new technologies of telephone, telegraph, and electricity were creating an urban blight. Edison went to the public claiming AC current in these lines would endanger lives. And horrific accidents did occur, as this uh, scene where a line worker, John Feeks, hung trapped for hours. Edison promoted his DC system as far safer than AC, and he waged a public relations campaign for citizens to vote to keep dangerous AC current out of their cities. But Edison decides to build one AC powered product. He would use it to demonstrate the danger of AC current, and it becomes a part of a nasty public relations battle. The electric chair. The product was the electric chair and, and neighbors of Edison's lab in West Orange knew to keep their cats and dogs near home where they could fall victims to Mr. Edison's testing. Edison kindly donated an electric chair to be used in Buffalo, New York, near Niagara Falls to electrocute William Kemmler. Edison even suggests a name for the procedure, hoping the phrase, having the prisoner Westinghouse might catch on. Witnesses viewing the procedure stated it would have been kinder to chop him up with an ax. Over Edison's best efforts, Westinghouse wins the contract to harness the power of Niagara Falls. Science wins out over the PR man. 
And this uh, 1890 view of the first major hydroelectric power plant at Niagara Falls. An interior view of the powerhouse and another view of the second powerhouse. This postcard is an overhead view of the Columbian Exposition, a World's Fair held in Chicago in 1893. And it becomes the site of the next battle of the currents. Again, Westinghouse battles Edison for the contract to electrify and light the fair. Westinghouse wins by undercutting the bid by 50%. Until this time, the Edison interest had been allowing other companies to produce light bulbs without ob obtaining a license to use the Edison patent. But after losing the bid, the Edison interest thought it might be a good time to enforce the patent. Since the Edison patent specifies a filament in a glass bulb permanently sealed in a vacuum, Westinghouse gets around it with a stopper bulb, not a permanent vacuum, and races to build enough stopper bulbs for the exposition. And the stopper bulbs worked. The view to visitors to the fair in 1893 must have seemed really magical view. And a brilliant searchlight at night signals that the world that AC electricity can do the job. This interior view shows displays by both Westinghouse Electric and General Electric. But Westinghouse has to borrow heavily. The rapid growth of, was necessary to build the company and it was expensive to expand the electric industry. This postcard shows how the East Pittsburgh facility had grown. And more facilities are opened in Newark, New York, Cleveland and Bridgeport, Connecticut. This photo shows just one of the large aisles in the main building. And equipment went to this testing floor before shipment. George Westinghouse may have won the Battle of the Currents, but he personally loses the war. In the financial panic of 1907, Westinghouse loses control of his own company to the financial interests. He dies in 1914. In his life, he's credited with 361 patents and having created 60 different companies. But Edison also loses control of General Electric and states that he is finished with the electric business. So World War I brings many government contracts to the Westinghouse Corporation, including a contract to build a million rifles, most to be sent to the Tsar of Russia. To fill the orders, Westinghouse buys and refits factories in East Springfield and Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. And the government contracts introduced Westinghouse Electric to the radio business. Fortunately, a young Westinghouse engineer, Frank Conrad, already a radio enthusiast, is eager to take on this job. Three models of radios were built by Westinghouse, the Model RB, the SC-1414 aircraft receiver, and the SC-1012A. The models with the SE designation were designed by the U.S. Navy Department of Steam Engineering. Westinghouse built the receivers in the Newark Works facility. This is an early picture of the Newark Works. Uh, the facility was primarily used to produce incandescent light bulbs. As World War I ends, the contracts to build radios run out. And wa wanting to stay in the radio business, Westinghouse purchases International Radio and Telegraph, formerly Nesco and holder of the patents of Reginald Fessenden, and they also option and then buy the patents of Edwin Armstrong. Their first effort is to try to build a radiogram business. But what business plan did they really have for radio? There was no room for another radiogram service. The amateur radio field was small and was their purpose just to keep their arch rival General Electric from getting a monopoly in radio? Meanwhile, in East Pittsburgh, engineer Frank Conrad had to test the radio equipment he was building. He made use of his amateur radio equipment located above the garage at his home to send the test signals. The easiest way to play phonograph, uh, to send test signals was to play phonograph records into the microphone. This free music in the ether was soon noticed by amateur radio experimenters and further publicized in amateur radio periodicals. This photo shows the equipment upstairs in 
Frank Conrad's garage licensed as 8XK. As public interest in hearing this free music grew, the Horns department store in Pittsburgh began to sell simple radio sets and the parts to build some produced by a local entrepreneur. When Westinghouse Vice President Harry P. Davis saw this story, one of those stopper bulbs must have lit up right over his head. Here was the business model he needed to make money on radio. First, create the demand by transmitting free music and information by radio. Second, create the supply of radios to sell for sale to the public. Now Westinghouse wouldn't build just one or two commercial radios, but rather thousands of radios for thousands of homes. Soon store, stores like this would be opening up to help people buy the equipment needed to listen in. So Westinghouse moves ahead rapidly with a plan to build a transmitter station to broadcast radio to the public. Station KDKA is licensed and broadcasts the elections results of the Harding Cox election of November 2nd, 1920. The engineer uh, mans the transmitter, that's the bigger box in the back of the, of the room. And the announcer is in the center speaking into that white box that's actually the microphone. The staff members get the election results wired from the Pittsburgh Post. And reports show that the broadcast was a success. The KDKA facility was soon improved. This room allowed the staff to receive reports by phone or telegraph and type up the uh, message for the announcer. The transmitter room is in the rear. This Westinghouse RB receiver on the table could monitor what is on the air. And this colorized image is the transmitter room. Uh, this is part of the original antenna mast in on the top of the East Pittsburgh plant. And this photo is the uh, 1925 studio. Conrad and his staff continued to experiment uh, with, with equipment to improve KDKA. And uh, they conducted shortwave tests to relay broadcasts or to send direct programming. This pair is a, a, a Westinghouse rebroadcast set where on slightly what, what they called short wave at the time, they could receive something from KDKA and, um, and then rebroadcast it on a local radio station. They also had early FM experiments at KDKA. Frank Conrad and Donald Little and others were granted pan patents on uh, early FM work. But at the time, the efforts for FM were for narrowband FM with the idea of trying to find a way to get more uh, broadcast stations in the limited uh, bandwidth that was available. Um, the experiments actually on KDKA mostly proved that that wouldn't be practical. This is the interior and exterior views of the station no longer located at the East Pittsburgh plant. And not quite the Hindenburg, the KDKA blimp was used to raise a temporary antenna for experimental transmissions. This is Harold Arlen, who may be considered the first broadcast radio announcer, but he's also the first paid radio announcer whose only job was to be announcer. Didn't have to share other jobs around Westinghouse. The KDKA had its own orchestra. And as radio grew in popularity, celebrities started to put their voices on the air. This is Will Rogers entertaining the ladies at KDKA. Newspaper ads like these told the anxious public that radios were being produced, but they came with a cost, as much as $1,600 in $2020 for a simple radio set. And radio brought families together, though often tied up in a tangle of headphone wires. They wanted to listen in, but not dad's the one in control. The simplest and least expensive radio sets were crystal radios. The point of contact with the mineral, often galena, acts as a rectifier, taking the RF energy from the antenna and sending audio signals to the headphones. There was no amplification, so 
strong signal is required, meaning a long antenna. Early home radios would not have been possible without Armstrong's regenerative circuit. This simplified diagram shows how it works. L2, L1, and C1 send a tuned signal to the detector tube's grid circuit, and the output in the plate circuit is fed back to the input through coupling by L3, called the tickler. The amount of feedback can be controlled by changing the proximity of L3 to L1 or the tuning of the plate circuit by C2. This circuit was used in receivers like the Westinghouse Areola Senior. It used one vacuum tube. The tube socket is on the left and the tuning coil is on the bottom. The rheostat controlled the filament voltage of the vacuum tube. The next step up was the model RA tuner and the model DA detector amplifier. If purchased in a signal cabinet, it would have been called the model RC. It used three vacuum tubes. The circuitry is shown in this diagram. Located in the RA box was the tuner circuit on the left, as well as the tickler coil above it. The amount of feedback was controlled by the open tap switches on the tickler. The output then fed into a two-stage audio amplifier. The listener could control the sensitivity by selecting which headphone plug to, to use as shown on the top. A local station received on headphones may only need the um, detector output. Weaker signals and, and driving a small speaker would require audio amplifiers. Rheostats control the filament voltage as each filament in these tubes drew five volts at one amp. So to save a trip to get your battery charged at the local gas station, you decide to try to keep your current draw down. The RA tuner unit contains the tuning condenser and coil and the tickler settings are on the contacts at the bottom. The DA unit shows the three model 01 vacuum tubes, detector in the front and the two audio stages. You can see the filament voltage rheostat and audio transformers along the bottom. As radio sales increase, a new facility is needed to produce the radios. The Westinghouse plant in East Springfield, Massachusetts is no longer needed to produce rifles and a skilled workforce was available. This would become the site to manufacture Westinghouse radios. Along with the decision to produce radios in East Springfield came the construction of broadcast station WBZ. Antenna towers soon went up on the factory and Westinghouse followed their business plan, supply the broadcasting to create demand for radios and then manufacture the radios to satisfy the demand. The top model RA tuner and DA detector were made in East Pittsburgh and then the lower pair in the new facility in East Springfield, Mass. There were only subtle differences and improvements during the production period. Tens of thousands of these were made. As the first broadcast stations were licensed, Westinghouse had four of the first 10. KDKA, WJZ, WBZ, and KYW, originally in, in Chicago. This colorized image is the entire WBZ station at the uh, studio and transmitter atop the East Springfield factory. This is the original WJZ in Newark. And soon KYW located in Chicago is on the air. <clears throat> During World War I, the Navy had complete control of radio. After the war, public use of radio was again permitted. To keep American control of radio, the federal government encouraged the formation of what's called the radio group which would control the patents needed to produce radio equipment. RCA was thus created as a partnership of GE, AT&T, and others. The value of the patents held by Westinghouse included Armstrong's regeneration and superheterodyne patents. That soon brought their membership into the group. Under the radio group agreements, <clears throat> Westinghouse continued to market their models already being sold. Those are some of the ones we saw in the pictures. 
The radio group agreement calls for a receiver production to be shared primarily by Westinghouse and GE, 60% GE, 40% Westinghouse. These models were sold by RCA and produced by Westinghouse. Some of the same models, as well as uh, improved models of Radiola 3 and uh, these bigger radios for home use, the Radiola 10 and Radiola 26. But RCA was dividing up production based on assigning some models to GE, some to Westinghouse, and it was hard to predict who would customers would buy 60% of one and 40% with the other. So they had to devise a new uh, time share, uh, order sharing plan. In this plan, all of the models were produced by both companies and the quantities ordered matched the 60-40 ratio. Over the 1920s, radio design improved from the regenerative sets to super heterodynes and the late 1920s brought out AC powered sets. These photos show experiments with hardware by Dr. Conrad that doesn't seem to be radio related. These were experiments actually with mechanical television. This article appeared in November 20, 1928 issue of Radio News. The story told of experimental broadcasts of movies by radio. As Frank Conrad demonstrates, the initial broadcast took place on August 8th, 1928. In this picture, we see that a high intensity lamp L1 passes its light through the scanning disc D. A second lens L2 then focused a point of light on the film F. Light that passed through the film was then picked up by photoelectric cell P. The disc only provided vertical scanning while the moving film provided the horizontal scanning. There were no real reports and there's no information on what receiver was used to, uh, to view the movie. <clears throat> this is the KDKA transmitter building in Saxonburg in the 1930s. And David Sarnoff at <clears throat> RCA begins a unification plan both Westinghouse and GE would stop production and they purchased, RCA purchases the Victor companies, uh, the plant where they made Victrola phonographs in Camden. So now RCA had a production facility and the role of GE and Westinghouse was simply to market the radios that were built by RCA. Here's one example. The ID tag on this model shows that it is a Westinghouse radio but manufactured by RCA Victor. And this table shows all the Westinghouse WR models and their equivalent RCA model that were um, built and sold in the period from 1930 to 1935. When the US Justice Department deems the unification as a monopoly, Westinghouse and GE are forced to divest their interests in RCA. David Sarnoff is given the opportunity to hire some Westinghouse personnel no longer needed at the Pittsburgh plant. Westinghouse and GE have to temporarily leave the radio market for a time to let RCA grow. Vladimir Zworkin, inventor of the Iconoscope TV camera tube, had been working for Westinghouse as an engineer and sometimes working on electronic television. Sarnoff takes him and his team to Camden where Zworkin famously tells Sarnoff that he could develop electronic television for $100,000. He would be off uh, by a few decimal places. When legally free to sell radios again, Westinghouse, a former pioneer in radio electronics, becomes a pioneer in outsourcing. Could it be that they didn't see the motivation to build their own radios when prices had fallen below $50 for a good radio as the depression moved along? This ID tag shows a mysteriously manufactured Westinghouse radio by the D Corp of Detroit. <clears throat> Westinghouse marketed their radios through their chain of Westinghouse electric supply company stores. Their electric equipment dealers could obtain the radios wholesale for themselves or for their customers. So many models were made by Westinghouse <clears throat> But the question arose, who was actually producing these radios? 
After some tedious research and a little help from some friends, these similar models were found to be made by Emerson. Everything was identical except for the cabinets. And the same for these sets made by American Bosch and sold identical sets with a different cabinet by Westinghouse. I was able to compile a list of suppliers for the WR radios in the 1935-1936 line. Then the trail went cold and we couldn't find any match for all these models that were made from 1937 to 1942 when production had to end for the war effort. American Bosch left the radio sales market <clears throat> and the same time Westinghouse was offering a full line. So we determined that and, and found proof that it was American Bosch that built all the radios in this period. But in 1939, the next big thing was arriving, television. Television was now on the market and Westinghouse, now too busy filling government orders for the coming war effort, again used the outsourcing idea, offering these Westinghouse models, all manufactured by, Westing, by RCA. This table shows the Westinghouse models and their RCA equivalents. Choices ranged from a five inch screen with no audio to the luxurious 12 inch screen. This 12 inch screen, <clears throat> the CRT was so long that the tube had to be mounted vertically and the viewer watched the reflection in the mirror. There was no effort to hide the real manufacturer as the RCA decals remained on the front of the cabinet. The biggest difference from the RCA TRK 12 was the use of a Westinghouse radio and there were some different cabinet dif uh, choices. The nine inch model was a direct view design. The built-in radios were very important as there was very little television programming each day. As war was starting in Europe, U.S. government orders for communication equipment quickly increased. The radio group that had been in Massachusetts was moved to Baltimore. Proximity to the Pentagon in Washington was the public reason. In reality, work had begun on a secret project, radar. This model is identical to the installation in Hawaii that detected the incoming Japanese fighter planes. Unfortunately, that warning was ignored. As the end of the war approaches, Westinghouse refits a plant in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. They state the purpose is to be ready for post-war consumer products, but in reality, they're still filling some government orders and, and more radar production. This is an overhead view of the Sunbury facility. Other divisions are opened in the southern tier of New York, supplying receiving tubes and CRTs and other products. Sunbury post-war production is slowed by remaining government contracts that needed to be filled. Um, <clears throat> but things were geared up and, and they began producing radios and the first FM radios in conjunction with broadcasting FM on KDKA. FM models like the H -E, the model H161 were introduced and then more models soon followed. Westinghouse was a leader in FM transmitter production too. Building complete installations on remote high terrains often included building a home for the engineer and his family. Westinghouse saw the need for a new modern production facility. They chose Metuchen, New Jersey. Here they were gonna build the new Miracle Mile assembly line that would produce radios and televisions from the components to the finished product and then shipped from the rail line at the rear of the lot. This 1954 color TV built in Metuchen was one of the reasons to move to Sunbury from Sunbury. The location between New York and Camden had many benefits. The area had a good transportation option as well as talented technical workforce to draw from. Also at this location, they could receive the RCA color TV test broadcast from the Empire State Building. Unfortunately, 
This TV was expensive and ahead of its time, so few were made. Westinghouse was also using the facility at the time, as well as Sunbury, to keep filling government orders uh, left from the war and, uh, and now from the Korean War. This caused delays for Westinghouse in tooling up for other consumer products. Westinghouse did capture its share of the portable TV market as Americans started to buy that second TV set. Also, they produced early transistor radios, even manufacturing their own transistors. This table shows the commercial and government radio divisions from 1912 to World War II. You can see some originally in, uh, in Pittsburgh area, uh, the Newark Works in, in New Jersey. Radio engineering stayed in, in East Pittsburgh, uh, filling government orders. And, um, and then eventually moved to Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts, and then the move to Baltimore during the war. Hmm. Finally, Sunbury. <clears throat> this table shows the home radio and television divisions from 1920 to the end in 1975. Again, starting uh, East Pittsburgh, East Springfield, then Camden, New Jersey with the RCA Victor Company then all of the outsourcing, um, and then the home radio products starting in Sunbury and the uh, move to Metuchen, New Jersey with a couple of name changes. In 1975, they're sold to White, Westing, White Consolidated Inter Industries, which becomes White Westinghouse. As Westinghouse Corporation grew, the position of the radio and television division moved down the corporate ladder where they used to be right up at the top, you can see here that they've moved down to uh, the uh, below the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. So what was happening with Westinghouse? <clears throat> By the 1970s, Westinghouse had over 100 divisions building over 100 products. In the 1980s, annual income passes $10 billion and the company has 150,000 employees. Products range from light bulbs to nuclear power plants. At one time, they even had a division that produced brass ID tags for their equipment. They had media companies, they had financial service companies, and a division to provide office furniture just for their own offices. Mike, uh, five minutes. Okay, we're good. So what went wrong? Uh, they had nuclear fuel contracts to sell to sell a nuclear power plant required a guarantee of the fuel costs. Well, that brought a $2 billion loss and an entry into the financial services business came at a bad economic time and caused a $3 billion loss. The um, corporation was huge and hard to manage and suffered losses from foreign competition. So what can be done to stop the fall? How about new management? Uh, how about different new management? How about different new management again? And how about now a change in direction? <clears throat> Since media companies were consistently profitable, why not become a media company? Westinghouse purchases many media companies, including CBS. Westinghouse begins selling off other divisions. Westinghouse forms a division to sell off other divisions. You can buy the name, you can buy the building, Toshiba ended up buying the nuclear power plant business. And then they make it, Westinghouse makes it official and changes the company name to CBS. So after 111 years, the Westinghouse WX stock symbol is removed from the New York Stock Exchange. The home appliance and TV business uh, divisions were sold to become White Westinghouse and the Metuchen facility after being rented out for years is torn down in 2017 to become an Amazon distribution facility. That building that housed the last Westinghouse electric plant was demolished and the bricks were crushed for fill material. These two bricks were the last remaining fossils that are now in my collection that were part of the last Westinghouse TV and radio factory. They're guarded 24 seven by my faithful companion, Lila, unless somebody offers her a couple of candy bars. So thanks for watching. Um, some of the credits go to 
website of the Radio Historian, the Radiola book by Eric Winnis, uh, Radio Manufacturers of the 20s by Ellen Douglas, the Early Television Foundation, Steve McVoy, and the book, uh, The Early Days of Radio Broadcasting. Great and, presentation. Uh, thank you. I, I know uh, I'm the last, but uh, you know I'm hoping for a lot of votes, and uh, I'm going to demand a hand recount if that uh, doesn't work out. Here we go. All right, uh, Marty, uh, what do we have for a question? Okay, we got a couple uh, couple things I saw here. Let's see. Um, uh, one person asked, "Had the New Deal consolidation happened, what have what would have ha have happened?" I don't quite know what that refers to. Um, I think maybe if it didn't, that unification didn't happen. Um, right. You know, when, um, when it became RCA and they had to divest, uh, that was what the famous quote from David Sarnoff, where he said the government handed him lemons and he made lemonade. Um, Westinghouse uh, was busy certainly with other things and, and received a huge uh, payoff in, RCA stock. So I don't think anyone uh, was really hurt by that. Um, and then certainly, uh, you know, at the time, I think it had a big impact that the, the markup on a radio had fallen so much that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't something that you'd fight to get into. So, um, Bill, a question for Mike. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Westinghouse made cameras that were used on the moon. Can you talk about the Westinghouse camera and lens division? <clears throat> um, one of the AWA members actually was involved in the, uh, I believe, in the color camera that went to the moon. Um, I, I know that uh, a lot of that would have come from, I, I believe, a special products division, which was in that uh, uh, chain of businesses they started along the southern tier of New York. Um, they made special CRTs. They made a, a lot of things for use in satellites. And um, probably some of the uh, AWA members could uh, could speak a lot better to that because a lot of them are retired from there. Uh, Marty, a question for Mike. Let's see, I, I think we got to most of them. And uh, I don't see any in the chat uh, uh, right here. Uh, one person... Uh, um, let's see, there's, there's not, a, there's not, a, I don't see any of any more questions in the chat. What a fantastic presentation and such great information. Just personally, I think this is really a great, great, lots of good information and history. Remember to vote. Yeah. Thank you. Lot, uh, lots of people giving you uh, kudos for this presentation, including me. Thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, can you comment on, uh, Nikolai Tesla? as the real inventor of radio compared to the more general understanding that uh, believes it's Marconi? Uh, yeah, the general thing is, well, a lot of things you, you have to look at when someone invents something, did they apply it to anything? Did they make any use of it? That's one factor. But it also wasn't, um, to my understanding, it wasn't radio um, as electromagnetic radiation as as Maxwell would have said that it was uh, using some ground conduction. And um, my understanding is most, a lot of those type of experiments uh, uh, were lost by, by resistance in the ground as, as you go away from the transmitter. I believe uh, one of the AWA reviews have, has a long article um, uh, on that subject by Eric Wainis. So, um, Mike, when did KYW change from Chicago to Philadelphia? And then, I, and then to California, I believe. Um, I, I don't know. I kind of think it had something to do with uh, the FCC just uh, juggling where the uh, alphanumeric assignments went. But uh, I don't know that it, a station physically moved. I think just it was a call link, sign change. Right, right. Bill, uh, any other questions that you can find there? Uh, yeah, I found one. Uh, so was the RCA slash Westinghouse TT5 a budget model pre-war television since it had it required a radio for its audio output? Yeah, that was the low end of the uh, of the market. And, um, and it would have gone to someone who might have had a very big, expensive console set. And then they could, when they wanted to w watch TV, just put that on top of it. Five inches, you can imagine, is is pretty much like trying to get the family to sit around and watch something on your cell phone. Um, 
the um, but it was certainly the low end price wise. And the um, there was a five inch console that had the big radio uh, built into it. There was also a change uh, on those 1939 sets. The uh, the uh, audio was AM, and then um, post war uh, was switched to FM. Uh, thank so you, Mike. Just a simple yeah. AM set to the right frequency would have gotten your broadcast. Marty, uh, another question for Mike. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat and in the Q and A about uh, TVs today that bear the Westinghouse name, and people want to know if you yeah, knew anything um, about that. They sold the name rights. Um, you know, different Chinese manufacturers wanted something recognizable. You can buy <clears throat> a lot of the old names and put it on a product. You can get Emerson. You can get, uh, uh, well, Zenith is Gold Star. Um, they're all owned by just the rights to the name to foreign uh, manufacturers. Um, Bill, another question for Mike. Okay, so... Uh... There's a question from somebody that is asking to verify um, that uh, after uh, uh, Zwerkin showed the TV demo to Westinghouse management, they said, nice, but can you uh, show us something that can make the company money? Yeah, that's true. And, and, and he was, you know, it was almost like you can fool around with this in your spare time. <laughs> um, Zwerkin's first job at um, Westinghouse was to design a way to uh, speed up manufacturing uh, vacuum tube filaments for the first uh, tubes that were in those earliest radios um, to get that. To, they were making the filaments for vacuum tubes by hand and treating them in, in different uh, chemical treatments one at a time. And so when, uh, when that was successful, even though at one point he blew up the laboratory, um, they said, well, we're going to put you on to bigger and better things and let somebody else blow up the laboratory. But uh, he he tried to convince Westinghouse that TV was possible. And um, probably if you look at the history, um, he was doing experiments at small time that were probably tracking around the same things that um, um, Farnsworth was doing on his own, too. And then our, uh, Sarnoff um, bit the bullet and said, uh, yeah, we're going to try to develop this. Sarnoff never believed $100,000 would do it. He, uh, he often called um, Zwerkin, not his best engineer, but his best salesman, because he sold him on the idea of developing television uh, at that low price. But uh, they, they knew what they were getting into. They had to actually build an industry. But, um, yeah, he, he, it just, just was Westinghouse was never interested in it. They just saw it as too far down the road. So, uh, Marty, a final question, please. Sure. Uh, let's see here. Um, somebody asked, in the 1970s, you could buy radios that allowed you to listen to TV. You mentioned TV that didn't have audio. Were, uh, were the, there products that allowed people to listen to TV in the 40s? No. Um, and there wasn't enough broadcasting to make it worthwhile. Uh, when, when those 1939 sets came out, I have copies of some of the original uh, broadcast uh, schedules for the day. And they'd start with five o'clock in the afternoon, test signal, six o'clock in the evening, test signal, seven o'clock, wrestling from Madison Square Garden, eight o'clock, test signal, then maybe nine o'clock, a movie. So um, <clears throat> in 1939, if you wanted to, you could have still gone to an AM radio and picked up. Um, it would have to probably been a uh, multiband radio, but you could have picked those up if you wanted to. But they're really... Um, just wasn't much going on so now those radios were just another uh, they were talking about portable transistor radios um i can remember actually thinking about buying one and it was just because i was working the summer as a toll collector and i could bring the sound from a tv show into the uh, toll booth with me so it was just a way that you couldn't get television and maybe you can hear your show as a uh, fallback well, thank you, Mike. Uh, been a great presentation and uh, really uh, tremendous photos. And uh, we really appreciate you participating as our final presenter here for the Radio Club of America Technical Symposium.